materials. Uh, so uh, materials that, uh, that uh, oops, where? Has disappeared. Materials that are nanostructured and uh, that can be used to perform these uh, tasks, converting, uh, en uh, converting energy and storing energy in, a, in an efficient way. And of course, the, nanost uh, the nanostructured nature of these materials is like an additional degree of freedom one can use to tune the properties of these materials. So one has to understand how the nanostructured feature of these materials affect their functionality. But of course, um, if, if you think that you have reaction taking place at the surface of a nanoparticle, this also means that these materials are much more uh, sensitive to the actual operating conditions. So a surface can be modified easily by, uh, by uh, changes in the environmental conditions. So nanostructural materials are, uh, can be used for all sorts of applications. For example, this uh, represents uh, titanium dioxide nanotubes uh, used in dye sensitive solar cells. Of course, the, the, the, the high aspect ratio helps in having a high surface where to absorb the dyes that can absorb light uh, to produce electricity, but the, the longitudinal nature of the tubes helps maintaining the contact with the, with the electrical, with the outside electrical circuit and maintain electrical contact throughout the system. So, so the nanostructured nature of this of these materials is essential for the for the high efficiency of the system. Platinum nanoparticles, in, for example, in fuel cell, are a, I mean, are a, a commercial uh, um, have a commercial reality now. And of course, nanoparticles can display different facets. So, in each of them, will have um, different chemical and electrical properties. So, um, it's not irrelevant whether you have different shapes and, and, and you have to understand how this shape is affected by the environment. And, and last, another example of research is that silicon nanowires as possible anodes for, uh, for lithium ion batteries. Again, uh, an example where, where the particular shapes helps maintaining electrical contact while offering high surface area and possibility to expand in the empty space around. So, so in all these cases, as I said, it's important to understand how the, the particular properties of the materials, the atomic structure, the surface appearance, and so, uh, the electronic properties, so on and so forth, affect the functionality. So the photocatalytic activity in the case of uh, hydrogen production, for example, the lithium storage capacity, but also uh, it's, it's also very important to understand how the environment, so the operating condition or, or even the production conditions affect the properties of, of, these, uh, of these materials. So, so a large body of research is dedicated to understand these relations of so these arrows going down to obtain a control and an understanding over what is happening in these systems. And uh, well, and the hope is actually to be able to be moved to the right to perform materials design. Once you want to perform a certain task, to be able to understand which is the optimal nanostructure, the optimal material, the optimal appearance of, of these materials, and under which conditions they can be uh, produced and or operated. So, so this is a bit uh, the, the conceptual uh, slide that shows the logic behind much of uh, what we do and uh, and uh, of course we are theoreticians so what we we try to uh, answer some of these uh, questions by using uh, uh, methods of uh, well I think I'm going to say more now uh, methods of uh, electronic structure calculation high performance computing in practice uh, the basics of, of, of the methods we used is that we consider systems consisting of uh, atomic nuclei and electrons. And, uh, and the atomic nuclei are classical particles while the electrons are quantum objects. And, and we, study, we can study the evolution of these systems with time or, or we can study the uh, optimal configuration of these systems. So, for example, uh, as I show here right, this is a platinum salt. So the, the atom here at the center is a platinum atom. 
uh, this, uh, uh, which is bound to two chlorine ions and two water uh, molecules. Of course, in the simulation, this was immersed in a, in a big box of water, which is not shown here. And then when you add one electron, so you reduce the salt, and this additional electron goes and occupy a particular orbital, which is shown here in blue. And the consequence of this reduction process is that the salt changes its configuration, loses the two water uh, molecules, and changes from a, from a, a quadratic, uh, um, sorry, from a square configuration to a linear configuration. And of course, the, the orbit, the, the electronic states change during the evolution as well. So this is the kind of uh, calculations that one can do. Uh, but of course, the big problem here is that you don't have only one electron, you have many electrons in this system, each atoms contribute with a substantial number of electrons. So you have, in practice, in the simulation, hundreds and thousands of electrons uh, easily. And, uh, and, uh, and it's not possible to solve directly, directly the many electron Schrodinger equation, which is actually the level of theory we would like to apply. So that's why we employ uh, density function theory, which basically allows us to recast this many electron problem in a, in a kind of effective one electron problem. So we move from the many electron Schrodinger equation to an equation, uh, the Kohn-Sham equation, which has a form of, of a one electron equation. You see the, the, the, the, the wave function now depends only on the coordinate of one electron. But of course, and, and this, this, uh, this, uh, this correspondence could be in principle be exact, uh, barring the fact that there are terms that contains the, the electron-electron interaction that are not known in exact form, so they need to be approximated. So, so basically what we do is we solve an approximated version of the many electron Schrodinger equation. There is a whole range of approximations uh, of um, uh, that can be used, and people have developed an understanding of uh, which approximation are able to describe electron in which situations and for which kind of system. So it's a quite a, uh, an extensive uh, uh, field which I'm not going to, to spend much about. So of course, this is the basics. Then on top of that, there are methods that starting from this can go beyond this basic theory, and uh, you can. Uh, calculate free energies, uh, you can do spectroscopy with some effort. So, so uh, I'm not going to, to, to, um, to say more about that. Uh, you probably heard something in the, in the previous days. So, and, and with these techniques, we, we, we have a look at the system of interest. We try to uh, understand some of the properties uh, of system of interest, as I said, beside photovoltaic systems, here I show a dye attached to a titanium dioxide substrate. Uh, we also interested in, in battery materials and what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about today, uh, uh, photoelectrocatalytic systems for the production of solar fuels. Actually, uh, what I'm going to focus on is on the, on the production of uh, hydrogen from water. So, and clearly, the real system is very complex because these are not simple materials. They are never square, rectangular shape like this. So they have defects, dopants. You have interfaces, solid and liquids. You have very complex processes uh, that are, I think, shown. Uh, so for example, the, the, the, the, this is the photoanode, which is, in my case, a hematite, an iron oxide which absorb light and performs parts of the chemistry, uh, which is not rectangular, but usually looks like this. So it's a cauliflower-like nanostructured material. Um, and, and a lot of, to, to, uh, the, the overall process is composed of very, very complex sub-steps. So here it's a more conceptual representation of the same system. So here is my, my photo anode. And I have photoabsorption taking place inside, so electrons are promoted from the valence band to the conduction band, but then I can have recombination processes. And hopefully, if, I'm, if things work well, I can able to separate electrons from holes and holes 
travels to the interface with the, with the electrolyte, which is again water with ions, and, uh, and there uh, the holes uh, contribute to the, to the chemistry of, of water being uh, uh, oxidized to, to oxygen here. So it's a, it's a very complex uh, process overall, and, and all these sub-processes also interact with one another. So if one wants to, to have an understanding of what is happening, have also to understand not only the single sub-process like photoabsorption or, or uh, uh, charge separation, but also how they interact with one another, because clearly uh, absorption of charged ions at the interface creates electric fields inside of the semiconductors and helps separating charges in the semiconductor and vice versa photoabsorption produces produces holes that travel to the surface they can uh, on their side if they don't participate immediately to chemical reaction they can change the charge state of the surface so they can counteract the electric field that that help uh, charger combination so so um it's a very interesting and very and very complex system. So, the, and the, the disadvantage of our method is that we cannot simulate this all together. So it's impossible. But it's we we also try to turn it into advantage. We can try to characterize uh, si the simple processes one at a time to understand what is happening in every component of this material and to to rebuild together the mechanism once we understand the elementary processes, which is also uh, something that on the other side, it's impossible to do in experiments. You, you have the overall uh, process, but it's not so easy. And, and in a complex process like this, also the, the experimental techniques uh, can reach a very limited understanding because you have very many processes taking place at the same time. And in the experiments, it's not so easy to disentangle them and to understand how they are connected to one another. So, so uh, the role of the simulation is to provide some insight into some of the elementary processes. And in particular, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, what happens at the interface between the, the iron oxide, so the photoanode at the electrolyte, where, where water arrives and through four subsequent steps of proton couple electron transfer so basically electrons are given up to the oxide and protons are transferred into the solution you you transform two water molecules first through some intermediates like the oh the oxygen and this this oh group to uh to ox uh, oxygen molecules that then can dissolve as gas from the, from the interface. So, uh, of course, the first question is here, the surface just represented as a line, but the first question is, how does it look like really under operating condition? Because a change in the composition of the surface will, of course, have an impact over these processes. And, and the question on how the surface looks like is, how does the surface look like under operating conditions? So when you have um, a bias, an electric bias, you have the water, you have the oxygen, so on and so forth. So we started from the basics. So this is our surface. You have to think that the, the plane of the surface is actually perpendicular to the slide. So this is our, our crystal, which is cut here. And of course, you can have different terminations, so you can cut it in different way. You can have only oxygen at the surface, only iron, and this. Can, uh, and and the first task was to understand this, and we started actually from a very simple system where this surface interacts only with an oxygen gas, and we calculated the phase diagram of the surface in dependence of the chemical potential of the oxygen gas. So this contains the information on temperature and pressure of the oxygen gas. So and you see that when you have a, a high uh, oxygen pressure the surface contains more oxygen this is not surprising and as you decrease the the oxygen pressure the the surface is more and more iron rich well qualitatively there is nothing surprising but we are really have the detail of which termination are present under which condition which is quite in line with detailed experiments that can be done when the surface is just in contact with the gas that's a, a, an easier situation where we have 
much more controlled. There are very good experimental techniques that can provide a detailed characterization in this case, and that's why we wanted to start from this simple case. And then we moved on to add complexity. So when we add also water vapor, the surface gets hydroxylated. Again, this is not surprising. People know that if you put an oxide in contact with water, it will get hydroxylated. But we also provide detailed understanding of the phase diagram of this, uh, of this hydroxylation in presence of water vapor. Then we also added the effect of the bias, which I'm not going to show, to show that actually under operating condition, much of the hydrogen is gone and you have an oxygen rich surface where the, the, the, the reaction should take place. And uh, so with this knowledge, we have now characterized the thermodynamics of the, of the surface under uh, conditions that contains much of the ingredients of the real system. And we now turn to, the, to understanding the, the reaction. So we studied the, the free energy of the four intermediates of the reaction that I showed before, independence of the applied electrical bias. So at zero bias, uh, Oh, sorry, at zero bias, the reaction does not take place. All so the intermediates are higher in free energy than the, than, the, than the reactant, so it will not take place. When you apply the bias with just uh, the, the bias that it's necessary to make the products um, thermodyn in thermodynamic equilibrium with the reactants, the reaction does not take place either because it's true that the reactants and products are in thermodynamic equilibrium, but in, in the middle you have some steps up in energy, so it will not take place, and this is of course quite obvious, so we can calculate at which bias, which bias you have to apply in the dark to have the reaction consisting of four steps down, and tells uh, down that it, uh, it turns uh, um, uh, out that uh, um, that the overpotential that we calculate in this way is not so far from the overpotential people measure in actual electrochemical experiment on this system. So this gives us an idea that our description, though it's a very approximate description, I have not had time to talk about all the approximation, at least have some uh, resemblance to the real system, provide some some uh, understanding of the origin of some of these numbers. And of course, with this knowledge, we can then move on. What is the effect of defects of doping on this, on this, on this over potential? And we can observe, for example, the effect of end doping and of, of the presence of oxygen vacancy on this over potential. That, and in, in fact, it turns out that oxygen vacancies, uh, which are usually present actually even in, in the, in, in any oxide, uh, naturally uh, lowers the the overpotential, makes it even more similar to the to the measured one. Even though we have to be very careful, because our system, even though we we, we make a lot of efforts to include elements of reality, is still a very simplified system with respect to the to the to the experimental setup. So we uh, it, it still remains to be understood how the effect of what we neglect is on on these numbers. So. Uh, still, we, we obtain a picture of what is happening. We could obtain a qualitative understanding of what the effect is of modification of the surface, how it looks like under operating condition, and how uh, modification of the surface affect uh, this uh, these, uh, key number. So, um, but of course, what we studied so far is a simplified thermodynamics of, of the surface, neglecting much of the actually structural features of the whole interface, in particular the fact that uh, we have a solid electrode in contact with an electrolyte, so water with dissolved ions in between, and that uh, creates quite a complex uh, um, interface because this is a semiconductor, so you have electric field and charge redistribution in the semiconductor and in the electrolyte. So, so and uh, of course, we study the thermodynamics of neutral intermediates, but this is electrochemistry. So we have charges traveling uh, inside the semiconductors to the electro to the surface and interacting. So uh, there are a lot of other elements in this in this process that we have neglected so far. So so we turned out we turned 
uh, now to study to study the the structure of the interface and whether we can at least um, grasp the essential feature of this interface by our method so um, so what we did was to build a model of the interface water with the, with the iron oxide and and to charge so and and uh, of course this is now uh, molecular dynamics so we have of course to sample all the configuration space of the water to obtain meaningful values and we study the the the uh, change of potential between the inside of the semiconductor and uh, and the liquid and we do so well okay this is the planar average so you see the wiggling due to the presence of the pla planes of of ions and this is the macroscopic average so we average to obtain a flat potential into the of the semiconductor and in the liquid and uh, we charge the surface so we put um, uh, ions attached to the surface and we put counter ions in the in the liquid which is what uh, and mimicking the the double layer present normally in these electrochemical uh, interfaces and we studied how the potential changes as a result of this charging again there are a few elements missing with respect to the to the actual uh, system, but this is the first step to understand uh, the the electro uh, statics of the interface, in particular, uh, changing the surface charge and and uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, calculating the the potential drop allows us to ch to calculate the capacitance of the interface. Since we are just adding a few ions near to the surface, this is just the Helmholtz capacitance, so the, the, the, the capacitance of the first layers near to the interface, and to obtain some reference value, which, well, which uh, lies somewhere. I put this, I, I, you're not supposed to read this table. It's a very huge table with a lot of numbers, but this is meant to be an idea how many experiments and how, how different results they give for this kind of quantities, and our calculated uh, result is somewhere there in between so it means uh, probably that at least we our description is uh, is somehow meaningful even though uh, neither the experiments nor our calculation can allow us to to make a very direct and and precise comparison of the numbers uh, so so this is a um, a first idea that we are able to understand some properties of of this interface and of the process involved of course uh, we are uh, still somewhat at the beginning of a very long journey. So in, in, in particular, we plan to extend the study of the interface by switching from ab initio molecular dynamics to classical molecular dynamics when the interatomic interaction are described by some machine learning uh, based uh, uh, potential, um, hoping to, to be able to extend the study of the interface and to get more insight. So, so far, I'm almost done. Uh, so far, I've showed you a complicated system. I, sh I showed you how we try to understand and characterize things that uh, have been seen in the experiment. So it's, a, it's a more a process of understanding. Sometimes we also try to do the other, um, go towards the other arrow in my conceptual scheme towards materials design. For example, in, in photovoltaics, there is a lot of attention now uh, devoted to hybrid perovskites. In particular, hybrid perovskites seem to be very active, have some stability problems, but one of the problems is that they have the, the most active form contain lead. So there is a lot of research trying to get rid of lead. People have tried to substitute all sorts of uh, elements from the periodic table. And my idea is that maybe we could try to, to put as a cation instead a small atomic cluster there so i've designed uh, a series of uh, of hybrid perovskites with with small uh, um, uh, cluster as cations and i've showed that at least they are dynamically stable and uh, they are thermodynamically more stable than some known phases so um this is uh, this is uh, some encouraging result but of course the possibility that there may be other competing phases is huge so and since they have not been uh, uh, synthesized yet for the moment this is still a, a theoretical hypothesis but still i think it's important to 
come up with ideas and use our method to, to support them. So this is my contribution towards design of, uh, of Perovskite uh, so far. And uh, so summarizing, I hope I have convinced you that DFT simulation can provide insight at atomistic level into materials and processes of relevance for uh, energy conversion and storage. Well, I didn't talk about photoabsorption today, today, but I show you how to characterize chemical reaction and, and some of the electrostatic properties of, of these systems. And uh, in particular, I showed you uh, results for hematite and iron oxide that could be a potential candidate as photoanode for hydrogen production. And I spend a couple of words to, to talk about design of novel hybrid perovskites. And with the last slide, I would like to thank the people that have helped me in this journey. So uh, uh, Man Guyen, who is now a PNNL in the USA, Kanchan Ullman in Singapore, Ralph Gebauer at ICTP and other people in Trieste and uh, Samanea Tae and uh, Professor Mohamed Izadeh at the University of Tehran. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I didn't want to push you. I came only to have the microphone with me. Uh, question, please. It, it was a very interesting and very important uh, topic. Uh, so, uh, there is a there is... <laughs> Maybe, okay, maybe, uh, okay, yes, I will go there in case. Well, we talked already a little bit about it yesterday. Uh, the photocatalytic water splitting is, of course, very exciting, the idea. How is your perspective on how realistic it is and how far are we from a complete simulation? For a complete simulation or for a... Oh, okay, I thought you were asking about the real application. So, uh, we are very far. I think we are very far. There are processes like... And, I mean, you're an expert in excited state simulation. We have, we have excited charges then traveling to the surface, performing chemical reactions. So, I don't think the goal should be to simulate the whole process at once. I think is to uh, this is. I mean, I think I think it's unrealistic to say we will calculate uh, photocurrents or actual uh, uh, conversion rates anytime soon. Uh, I think this this is is at, at the moment it looks like an unrealistic goal. But I think there are a lot of, for example, these electrochemical interfaces. You have models from the 50s, continuum models from the 50s describing them. But then, if you look carefully, it's true that in some experiments, uh, depending on, for example, on dopant concentration semiconductors, they can be extended over hundreds of nanometers. But it's also true that in some experiments, uh, if you make an estimate, all this plays in a few nanometers. And, and we don't have an understanding of how interfaces look like when everything is happens in a couple of atomic layers because it, as, as i uh, mentioned before it's not so easy to characterize these these systems we are talking about solid liquid very dirty solid liquid because the the semiconductors dope the electrolyte is i mean you have ions in the electrolyte so of course you have uh, um surface specific like um, um some frequency generation but I mean, it's, it's a long way. And, and you would like to study that under illumination while the reaction takes place. So we are very far from simulating that, but also from the experimental point of view, we are very far from understanding really what's happening. We don't have, like in surface science, when you do experiments in presence of a gas, a low pressure, an STM, we can look at the atoms there. It's very difficult to do that here. So, so also from the experimental point of view, the characterization is still very, very tentative, and that's why I showed that table of the, on the capacitances. It's, it's, it's still a very, very um, uh, rough picture that we have, and I think that it's in this, in this rough picture, there is a lot that we can probably understand, but, but not by simu I mean, the goal is not to simulate the whole process. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Let's thanks again to the speaker and offer him the certificate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, we started 10 minutes uh, 
late and uh, my proposal would be to short the coffee break after 10 minutes to be here back for the second session. Thank you.
Does it work? Yes. Yes. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, the chairman of the session is not here, therefore, I am going to chair the session. I, I am Burcu Çakırlı from Istanbul University. Uh, there are four talks in this session. One of them, the last one, will be online. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Sandro Scandolo. I hope I pronounced yep, correctly. Uh, he's going to talk about deep learning simulations, a window into uh, Earth's uh, core. I also want to say one thing. Um, I really uh, want to hear questions from uh, young participants. Please don't be afraid about asking questions, OK? So if you don't ask any questions, you cannot learn. Okay. Feel free. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask you to give me a sign after 20 minutes? Can I, can I ask you to, after 20 minutes, uh, if you uh, can. You have uh, 30 minutes yeah, but after in 20 total. Minutes. So you can finish in 20 minutes and 10 no, no, minutes. No, no, as no. no. Give me a sign after 20 minutes. Sure. Yeah, so that sure. I know where I sure. am. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, come here. Uh, this is my first time to Bodrum, not to Turkey, fortunately. Uh, but it's really a beautiful place, and I wanted to thank all of you for, for being here today. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, simulations we are doing to try and understand the Earth's core. Now, the Earth's core is a very unknown place of the universe, uh, more unknown than we actually think. In fact, uh, the deepest uh, hole that was dug by human being is only 12 kilometers deep. So all we know about the Earth's core, about the structure of the Earth, actually comes from indirect information. It comes primarily from seismic waves. Uh, so we detect the seismic waves and we try to extract information about the structure of the Earth uh, from, uh, from seismic waves. So there's no surprise that uh, people have used their imagination to try to imagine what might happen in the Earth's core. I'm uh, still wondering what, why this is recommended for adult entertainment, but I don't, I don't know. So, um, a little bit uh, about the uh, solar system, uh, the structure of the planets. Uh, so we have uh, giant planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn, which are essentially made of primarily of hydrogen and a little bit of helium. Uh, there might be a core, but we're not actually sure whether there is a core in the giant planets. It might just be hydrogen and helium. There are other classes of planets like Neptune, Uranus, uh, that are more uh, so-called icy planets because they contain a lot of water, methane, ammonia, uh, lighter molecules and they have a, an envelope which is made of hydrogen and helium and then of course there are the uh, earth-like uh, the solid planets like uh, like the earth like mars like venus like mercury more or less all of them have the same structure the same structure means that we have a a crust a mantle the mantle is typically made of silicates and oxides and then there is a core which is made of iron primarily iron and perhaps a little bit of uh, of, of nickel um, what do we know about the internal structure of these planets in terms of pressure and temperature? So these are uh, diagrams that are very qualitative diagrams about the uh, pressure and temperature inside the planet. So here you see you know, the, uh, the evolution of the Earth, for example, when you move inside the planet, it's uh, the crust here, here's the mantle, and then starting from about uh, uh, uh, uh, 1300, uh, uh, uh, sorry, 130 gigapascals, 1.3 megabars, you enter into the core, and the core is essentially made of iron. So we know pretty well the pressure at the center of the Earth. It's about 3.6 megabars, 3.6 million atmospheres. We know it very well because we know very well the density. And the density, we know it well because of seismic waves, but also because of gravitational momenta, right? So we can actually, uh, we know that the, the value of the pressure within about 1% inside the Earth. What we know very little instead is, in, is the temperature inside the Earth. There's no way we can directly measure the temperature of the Earth inside in the core. And the current uncertainty is, is up to 2,000 uh, Kelvin. So it could be 5,000, it could be 6,000, it could be 7,000. We actually do not know with precision what the temperature is inside the planet. Not to mention, of course, the temperature of the, uh, of the other planets. The uncertainty is even bigger. We know the pressure reasonably well, but we know nothing about the, the temperature inside, inside these planets. 
Now, uh, uh, I've been talking about the solar system, but in fact, there is a talk about exoplanets that I noticed tomorrow. But I just wanted to uh, share with you this excitement that uh, in our field in planetary science exists uh, due to the discovery of uh, thousands of other planets outside of our solar system. Right? This was the discovery that was made already uh, more than 10 years ago by uh, Didier Kelo and Michel Mayor. He got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019 for the discovery of exoplanets. Now there are thousands of exoplanets that have been observed. And I just wanted to give you a feeling that all the planets we've been observing, if you classify them in terms of uh, uh, uh, masses and in terms of density, radius, if you wish, which can be measured, and you'll see a talk tomorrow, I guess, about how to measure the radius of, uh, of exoplanets, can be roughly speaking classified into Jupiter-like, Neptune-like, Earth-like. So this is to say there are probably thousands of Earths in, in, in the universe that are rotating around other solar systems. Now, what is the challenge for us uh, physicists, and in fact for condensed matter physicists, uh, I'm a condensed matter physicist myself, when we try to understand the interiors of planets? Interiors of planets means high pressure. I showed you pressures of the order of megabar, millions of atmospheres, uh, thousands of Kelvin of temperature. So the, the challenge for a condensed matter physicist is to try to understand the properties of materials at those, at those conditions. So let me give you a very popular example. I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with graphite and diamond. And I'm pretty sure you're also familiar with the fact that these are two forms of carbon, right? Graphite is characterized by uh, this uh, nice two-dimensional arrangement of the atoms, uh, uh, three-fold coordination, while uh, diamond is ca ca characterized by four three-dimensional uh, arrangement of bonds, uh, fourfold coordination. In fact, we also know that the mechanical properties of diamonds are extremely different with respect to the mechanical properties of, of graphite. But there are two forms of carbon, so two ways in which carbon atoms like coaggregate in the solid state, right? Now, uh, it turns out that these two phases of carbon are essentially degenerate if you try to calculate their free energies at ambient conditions. In fact, does anybody know what is the most stable phase of carbon at ambient conditions? You don't want to guess. Well, it's actually graphite. You might be tempted to say it's diamond because diamond is very strong, but in fact, it's graphite. Graphite is by a tiny, tiny, tiny, super tiny amount, slightly lower in, in energy with respect, to, uh, with respect to diamond, at ambient conditions, of course. Of course, there is a huge barrier of energy if you want to convert the graphite into diamond and vice versa. If you want to convert diamond into graphite, there is a huge energy barrier. But the energy of the two phases is essentially degenerate, right? So, and graphite is lower than diamond. So when they try to tell you that diamond is forever, it is not, right? It is there because it's a stable minimum, but thermodynamically speaking, graphite is lower than diamond. Eventually, perhaps, past the age of the universe, diamonds have to transform into graphite, right? So diamonds are not forever. What is interesting, however, is that if you increase the pressure and you go now to about 70, 80 kilometers deep in the Earth, you reach conditions where thermodynamically diamond becomes stable. Thermodynamically. So it now becomes the most stable form of carbon at those conditions. And in fact, this is where diamonds are formed. Diamonds form where carbon is brought down into the, into the Earth. It reaches these depths of about 70, 80 kilometers. It forms, and then it is brought back to the surface of the Earth by essentially convection. So this is why we have diamonds at the surface of the Earth, even though they are thermodynamically unstable. How do we know all this? Well, we know because high pressure has been a very you know, a prolific field of research. Let me just mention that it also gave one of the most unknown Nobel Prizes ever. I doubt that you ever heard the name of Percy Bridgman, unless you're a philosopher, because he was also a philosopher. He got the Nobel Prize in 1946 because he was the first one to achieve very high pressures in a, in a press, in a lab. Uh, a few years later, people realized what I just mentioned in the previous slide, that is that you can transform graphite into diamond using pressure and temperature. And the first man-made diamonds were made in 1955 by General Electric. Now they are a huge business, I mean, a multi-million business. In fact, 99% of the diamonds that you have at the surface of the earth that we use nowadays are produced in, industrial, in an industrial uh, uh, context, essentially. So let me go back to the earth and try to understand, I mean, how phase transitions actually affect our understanding of the Earth's core. I'm going to focus on the Earth's core, right? So I already said, I mean, there is a mantle, there is a crust, uh, there is a core, 
And the important thing to remember about the core of the Earth's core is that the core is divided into two layers. There is a deep layer where, where, where iron is solid, right? It's a solid uh, core. And then there is an outer layer in which uh, the system is actually liquid. So we're talking about liquid iron. And these are actually the, the main questions that geophysicists are asking uh, regarding the properties of the core. The main big question, as I mentioned at the beginning, is what is the temperature of the core? 5,000, 6,000, 7,000? What is the crystal structure of iron in the core? We know very well the crystal structure of iron at ambient conditions, right? It's BCC. But what do we know about the structure of iron in the inner core? Is it still BCC? Is it FCC? Is it HEP? Something else? And more importantly, how we can connect this information with available experimental information. Experimentally here means uh, seismic information, data coming from seismic waves. Now, there is, I mean, the, the, first, the two questions here are not particularly difficult. I mean, difficult. I mean, they can be attacked by condensed matter physicists, uh, crystal structures, uh, seismic velocities are essentially elastic constants because the sound waves in a crystal are what it, uh, are determined by the elastic constants. But what about the temperature of the core? How do we know the temperature of the core, right, from condensed matter physics? How can we determine that? Well, if you think about it, there is a very interesting connection here. And because if you just look at this point here, we have a solid which is in contact with a liquid, right? So it's a bit like putting ice in water and try to keep them at equilibrium. They are at equilibrium only if the temperature is zero, zero centigrade, right? So here, the temperature of the core at the boundary between the liquid part and the solid part must be the melted temperature of iron at core pressures, of course. Okay? If so, if we design an experiment or if we come up with a theory that calculates or determines the melting temperature of iron at that pressure, we have the temperature within some approximations of the Earth's core at this point, at least. OK, so high pressure physics, of course, uh, since the early days, has done a lot of progress. Uh, what, do we, what, can, what, can, what do we do today? Well, we, there is a lot of experimental research, uh, especially using shock waves. You send a shock, and you try to look at the response of your material. Uh, uh, you can use more uh, uh, accurate methods, which are based on this diamond anvil cell uh, device. Essentially, you squeeze your sample between two diamond anvils. Here, if you, the sample is only a few microns thick. Uh, it's actually very difficult to, to probe the sample once it is inside these uh, devices. And of course, uh, you can do atomistic simulations. And guess I'm going to talk about that, of course. But before I do that, let me just mention that if you take uh, the most uh, accurate method to study high pressure, which is the diamond anvil cell, you can nowadays reach very high temperatures at relatively low pressures, or you can go to very high pressures, but at low temperatures, but you don't yet get to conditions that are relevant for the Earth's core. Okay? So essentially what we're left with is, for the Earth's core at least, is primarily atomistic simulations or extrapolations of experiments uh, done at lower pressure and temperature conditions. So uh, back to molecular dynamics. I think uh, may maybe more of many of you are already familiar with molecular dynamics. Let's see if it moves. No, it doesn't. Sorry. It was supposed to, uh, to move. But anyway, what is molecular dynamics in a nutshell? You take some atoms, you put them in a simulation box, typically with periodic boundary conditions, right? Uh, because you want to simulate a macroscopic system. Uh, you calculate uh, the uh, derivative of the potential energy, uh, which is the force, of course, and then you evolve the position of the particles uh, using essentially Newton's equations. Okay, this is molecular dynamics uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. And with this method, we are now trying to, ex to look at uh, the, the properties of iron at core conditions by setting the right pressure, setting the right temperature, and of course, uh, uh, uh, trying to come up with an accurate potential of interaction for the iron atoms at those conditions. Now, molecular dynamics, as already was mentioned in the previous talk, has already has evolved into a sort of standard model uh, for quantum simulations in which uh, the molecular dynamics of the atoms, and once again, the atoms are heavy, so they are essentially behaving like classical particles. What is not classical, of course, is the electrons that are carried by the atoms. So for the electrons, we need to solve the Schrodinger, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation, no question about it. Mm -hmm. But a very important uh, observation, and in fact, this is an observation that was made by Oppenheimer, 
I hope you watch the movie, uh, uh, because Oppenheimer did his PhD with Max Born uh, in, in the 20s, in the uh, late 20s. And as a result of his PhD, he came up with this uh, approximation, which essentially states that uh, if you want to do classical dynamics on the atoms, which is fine, you can extract the potential of interaction for the atoms from the ground state of the electrons for that particular configuration of the atoms. Okay? So you fix the atoms in a given configuration, you determine the ground state using quantum mechanics for the electrons, you determine the ground state, and that energy is the energy that enters into the uh, evolution of the classical dynamics of, of the atom. Okay? And so what we call ab initio molecular dynamics is essentially, once again, the classical molecular dynamics in the potential energy surface E generated by electrons in their ground state here. Now, easy to say, much more difficult to implement in practice. Well, first of all, because as it was mentioned in the previous talk, solving this equation for a large number of electrons, you can have, you know, thousands of electrons, uh, hundred thousands of electrons in your simulation, is extremely complicated because there is a quantum many-body problem to, uh, to deal with in, in solving this Schrodinger equation. And as a consequence of that, the largest uh, simulation you can run typically with ab initio molecular dynamics is at most of the order of a thousand atoms. Okay, not more than that. So, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, to rescue, at least for the, for the many electron, uh, for the many body electron uh, uh, part of the, of, the, of the challenge, is density functional theory, right? If you're not familiar with density functional theory, essentially it coincides with the statement that the energy of a collection of electrons in a many body sense is the unique functional of the electronic density rho of x. Now, for this statement, which of course considerably simplifies the calculation of the ground state energy for a many electron system, uh, Walter Cohn got a Nobel Prize. Walter Cohn is the one on the right side, huh? just to be sure, right? Not the one on the left side. Got the Nobel Prize in 1998 uh, for work that was actually did in the, in, the, in the 60s. You can now, I mean, do your own calculations. Uh, there are codes available. Several, several codes were mentioned in this in the, in the, uh, yesterday, in the previous days. Uh, and this is my favorite one also because I'm one of the developers of Quantum Espresso. But just to say that you can now download your codes for free, open from the web. Of course, run those codes requires a little bit of expertise, but uh, there are also courses available, lectures available on the web. So but back to the problem, the problem of determining the properties of iron at core conditions. Once again, temperature, crystal structure, and try to connect with, uh, with seismic data. Uh, let me address the first point. How do we simulate melting, right? So I told you, in order to determine the melting temperature of the core, ideally, we would need to know that the melting temperature of iron at 3.3 megabars, uh, 3 million, uh, 300,000 uh, atmospheres, okay? So if we manage to do that in a simulation, we get the temperature of the, uh, of the Earth core. So the way we do this is by essentially, this is a standard way to calculate the melting temperature of, of a solid. You take your solid here, you uh, take the liquid corresponding to the same solid, you put them in contact, and then you run a simulation at a fixed temperature, and you see if this interface is moving to the right, right, that means the solid is freezing at the expenses of the liquid, and your temperature is below the mental temperature. If vice versa, this interface here is moving to the left, that is, the solid is melting and the liquid is growing in, in, in size, then of course you know that you are above the melting temperature, right? So what you do is essentially you tune your temperature in your simulation until this interface remains more or less in equilibrium. That is exactly the same configuration, I mean, the same situation you have when you have ice and water in a glass at zero centigrade, essentially. They just remain there at equilibrium. So this is a standard way in which we calculate melting in a, in, a, in a molecular dynamic simulation. There are, of course, other methods, but this is the main one, essentially. So you immediately see that in order to simulate melting, you need many more than just a thousand atoms, which is what you can afford with the standard QM VFT type calculations. So how do we try to go beyond that? Well, before I, I do that, let me actually show you this uh, you know, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, um, this, this uh, 
uh, let's say, balance between uh, chemical accuracy, which is what uh, quantum mechanics gives you, and statistical accuracy, which is what uh, classical potentials in principle give you. So these are early, the early results, already 20 years ago, uh, uh, uh, trying to calculate the melting temperature of iron at core condition. Uh, this is a initio quantum mechanical results, the dashed line here. So those, of course, were done with a few hundred particles. So imagine running this simulation with 100 atoms. There's a lot of uncertainty. Statistics is definitely not converged. And so this is the result they got uh, with the initial molecular dynamics. Vice versa, we did some simulations uh, which were not based on initial methods, but were based on what we hope were sophisticated classical potentials for iron, not based on quantum mechanics, and this is what we got at the time. As you can see, right, ab initio is chemically accurate but lacks statistical accuracy. Classical potentials have a, allow statistical accuracy because you can go up to, you know, 10,000, 100,000 particles, but they're not chemically accurate. As a result, you have a discrepancy in the two theories. Perfect. As a result, you have a, a, an uncertainty which of about 800 Kelvin in the in determination of melting. Fortunately, experimental uncertainty is even larger, right? So we, can ma we managed to publish these papers in Nature and Science and so forth, because experiments are still even, even, even far away, further away. So let me come now to the deep learning potential. So how did we solve the problem, or we hope to solve the problem? Well, we said we need, essentially what we need is an energy function, which is a function of several, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5th, particles here, which is what we need to use in molecular dynamics. How can we try to develop something that mimics that huge functional effectively? Well, that's exactly what machine learning does, right? You have an input. Machine learning is something that gives you a, a, a result out of, you know, a, a large number of input parameters. So what we do, we calculate the quantum mechanical energy on a few configurations, expensive but, but, but doable, and then we train, based on those configurations, the deep learning potential that we then use in molecular dynamics uh, uh, for our simulations. In fact, it's a bit more complicated than that uh, because there are a number of additional strategies that has to be uh, uh, uh, careful about. For example, one needs to use active learning. Active learning means that the machine learning part uh, informs uh, the, uh, the uh, quantum mechanical part in uh, suggesting configurations for the, uh, uh, for the training set. All that was done, of course, at the level of density functional theory for the quantum mechanical part. Another interesting point is that we have to be explicitly considering and varying the temperature of the electrons in the DFT calculation in order to be, uh, to be accurate enough. The bottom line is that the potential we generate, forget about this uh, slide, this, this uh, figure essentially gives the uncertainty of the potential with respect to the DFT, to the quantum mechanical potential, at different conditions. Overall, we get energies that are accurate with the deep learning potential with respect to DFT within 5 milli electron volts per atom. Now, if you convert it into Kelvin, it's 60 Kelvin, it's nothing. It's 1% of the melting temperature. Right? So we can claim accuracy of the order of 1% in terms of determination of the, of the melting temperature. So with this potential, we now started the simulation with a classical potential now, because it's a deep learning potential. We don't need to run DFT. We don't need to run a full-fledged quantum mechanical calculation for different phases, for the liquid, using different methods to calculate the free energies, using coexistent methods, but also using more sophisticated methods to determine the free energies that are based on thermodynamic integration. There's no time to go into any details. In other words, essentially, the bottom line is you can now calculate, if you, if you have stati sufficient statistical uh, uh, information, you can calculate directly free energies from the simulations. And then from the free energies, you can, comp you can look at the transitions by looking at which phases are of the lowest free, uh, free energy at different uh, pressure and temperature conditions. An interesting observation, which was something nobody had uh, you know, already mentioned, is that uh, at those conditions, uh, some solid phases, like BCC iron, display a considerable uh, self-diffusion. Right? And in fact, we find that this self-diffusion is especially important to stabilize BCC iron at those conditions, uh, mechanically. Right? So these are displacements, uh, diffusion, diffusion coefficients, which are you know, only an order of magnitude uh, smaller than that of a typical liquid. 
you're still in a solid, but you have an internal self-diffusion, which is essentially one order of magnitude less only with respect to that of a liquid. And we also looked at the mechanisms of uh, this self-diffusion. So this is the final result. It's a bit complicated. Let me just mention that uh, our curve is the red one, and it, and it fits very well with early, the most accurate DFT calculations that which, was, which were done so far, which are, however, only available at one point here. It also compared extremely well with experimental results, the most accurate ones, again. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, so we agree very well with experiments. We find that HCP is the only uh, stable solid phase of iron or core conditions. We find that BCC is mechanically stable, but not thermodynamically stable by a tiny amount. And the interesting part, however, is here. We calculate now the shear velocities of iron, trying to compare them with uh, seismic data. So what you see here is the seismic shear velocity at the Earth's core, in the Earth's core, right? This value here. You do it for HCP and for FCC, and you get something which is at this temperature, which is the temperature relevant for the core, is much is in total disagreement with what you measure with BCC instead. Okay, so we have a problem. We have HCP thermodynamically stable. On the other hand, BCC reproduces perfectly the the, uh, the, the seismic data. This is an open question. We don't have an answer to this yet. What we know, however, is that in the core, it's not just pure iron. There are also a number of light elements, like uh, hydrogen, sulfur, silicon. And considering that Gibbs free energy in the pure system between BCC and ACP are extremely small, we believe that impurities could actually change the stability of the two phases and could make BCC more stable and therefore explain the... Uh, so now we're actually trying to extend our deep learning potential to include also the light elements to see how the light elements affect the thermodynamic stability of... Uh, of the two phases. Let me just conclude on a light note. There's theory simulations, but there's also somebody even proposed the emission to the Earth's core. Right? You take a huge amount of liquid iron, you pour it inside a crack in the Earth. It's actually real. It was published in Nature. And you just let this uh, huge amount of iron just percolate inside the Earth and try to, uh, to, uh, to get to the Earth. It, it, this, this guy estimates that in a week or so, you should, you should get there in the core. Anyway, let me finish by thanking uh, Zhi Li, uh, my collaborator at the ICTP, an outstanding postdoc, and of course, huge amount of computer time on the national supercomputing facilities uh, uh, uh, in Italy. And thank you very much for your attention. We take the speaker for his nice talk. We have three minutes left for the questions. Any questions? Yeah, please. Julia Malana da da da da da Satkla Hangi aynı hoca arıyorsun Efendim hocam Tamam Ha evet hocam Filmiz mi bu Şu mu? Yok yok tabii hocam. 2023 evet, tamam. DFD'de. Tamam hocam görüşürüz. Tamam hocam. Nereye gitti? Atın şu şu. Atın şu şu. So uh, they measure the amount of time it takes for a, for a seismic wave to cross the core. And then from the, from the, from the size of the core, they determine the velocity of uh, shear wave. So it's a pretty straightforward measurement, except for the fact that you have to then extract, I mean, you have to subtract the effect of the mantle and of the crust and all that, but there are now techniques to do that. So I'm not sure this is really relevant for, uh, for seismic, uh, for seismology, the, mm -hmm. the effect of Coriolis forces and all that, because it's a very fast measurement. It, it measures the time it takes for the seismic waves to cross the core, which is, I presume, a few minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. Of Take course, it. there must be an earthquake, right? Yeah. Can you have shear waves in a liquid? Very good point. Uh, you don't, but what I'm showing here is results for the inner core. I'm talking about the structure of the inner core, which is solid. The outer core is liquid. In fact, uh, the, the reason we know that the, the outer core is liquid is precisely because we don't see any shear wave in the, in the outer core. Perfect, yes. Which means, by the way, that uh, since the inner core is inside, it's very, and you only have compressional waves coming from the outer core, Right? It's very difficult to excite shear waves in the inner core. 
but you can detect them. They are there and you can detect them. We should continue the session. Uh, okay, quickly. Um, thank you very much. I have two short questions. I mean, you use Quantum Espresso, and why don't you use a more involved code like Abinit, uh, able to treat more uh, evolved structures, for instance, or you see... You're asking more... me to compare my calculations with my competitors. <laughs> and, and, and the second question, so you use deep learning techniques, so you need uh, a, a, sufficient, a sufficient number of data, a rich database. It's not so evident to get this database in the thermodynamic apply, and you are investigating several uh, thousands of Kelvin and megabars. Uh, you can get some uh, experimental data from the uh, diamond uh, and V-cells experiments or laser fusion experiments, but I mean, I run that Z is equal to 26, so you are in th at the limit of the classification domain or something like this. So where do you find the data to, to make your code learn uh, properly? So the first question, uh, Abini, Quantum Espresso, VASP, uh, you name it, are more or less the same in terms of efficiency, in terms of type of calculations you can do. You will never be able to do this type of calculation in Tyler Binicio, regardless of the code you use, right? Uh, regarding the data, the, the deep learning potential is obtained from DFT. So we run a few DFT calculations, and based on that, we construct the deep learning potential, right? So we don't use any experimental information. We just use DFT calculations. Still, we need a lot of information dot BFT calculation, this is why we need to use, I mean, this is why we need to use 3 million GPU hours on the, uh, but we don't, we, uh, we do everything ab initio in some sense. We compare with experiments only later. Okay, and lastly, I would like to give your certificate oh, for your thank you. participation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. We thank again to the speaker, and the second speaker is Denis Aybash. Uh, she is going to talk about zero to ultra flow field nuclear magnetic resonance with optical magnetometers. So you have 25 minutes and five minutes for questions. Okay. All right, um, hello. Um, um, today I'll talk about zero to ultra low field NMR with uh, optical magnetometers. Um, the work that I'll talk about has been done during my postdoc at Berkeley and um, with my collaborators in Boston University and University of Mines. I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to give a talk uh, here back in Turkey. Um, it's, it's especially um, a, important for me to give a talk in the 100th year of our Republic's anniversary. I take my, um, I, I take my uh, inspiration from Ataturk and he has very inspirational quotes. The first one is uh, related to the um, 30th of August, which we just celebrated. And the second one uh, says, we just need one thing to be hardworking, which I completely, full-heartedly agree with. Um, right, so I said NMR, so magnetic resonance. And the core of that is magnetic sensing. Um, there has been, uh, even though today I'll talk about some advanced magnetic sensors, there are very, simple and um, classical uh, magnetic sensors uh, that exist. The simplest one is just a coil, a solenoid with a ferromagnetic core to increase the current running through it. Um, there are compasses that you take on your field trips with ferromagnetic needles that align itself with the Earth's magnetic field. There are hole probes that, um, that are sensitive to uh, static magnetic fields that, uh, that cause some current to flow through uh, conducting slab. Um, 
there are, similar to whole probes, carbino disks, different in geometry. This is to show that even a slight change in geometry uh, could, um, could, could, um, a, could um, inflict changes on your sensitivity, on, your, uh, on the way that you sense fields. Um, you can see that here we are sensitive to currents that are going uh, radially uh, in a disk. Um, so these are classical sensors that exist, um, that have been, that you see probably in your undergrad labs that you teach. Um, but um, what, what I like working on is, is, is, what I like working with is, is spins. Our spins that um, could be a single spin like people do in diamonds, color centers in diamonds. Uh, I personally like spin ensembles, so many spins, not just one. Uh, all together that, um, that are sensitive to some magnetic field and give you an idea of what magnetic field is. Right, so um, I, in the title I said optical magnetometer. So what does that mean? It means um, a measurement of magnet magnetic field with spins um, through their interaction with light. Um, right, so uh, the, um, is this light? Perfect, so let there be light. Um, so, um, the, a, the central thing here is the atomic magnetic moment mu that arises from the, uh, let's say you have a, a you have a, a, you know, uh, here it's a box, but let's say you have a cell of atomic gas, atomic vapor, um, not just one, but many, here I drew just one. Um, let's, uh, the atomic magnetic moment arises from the um, electron spins, the nuclear spins, and the orbital uh, rotation, uh, just the, the summation of that. Um, and if there is some magnetic field uh, that, is, um, that is around this uh, magnetic moment, the total magnetic moment, then there is a torque that exerts on this magnetic moment uh, around the magnetic field. There is a cross there. And uh, the, um, the idea is that you then have a definition of alarmer frequency where the spins start processing around a, a leading B field like you see here with a certain frequency called alarmer frequency that is dependent on the B field and the geomagnetic ratio uh, that depends on the type of nucleus that you have. The idea here is that uh, there is a frequency that is dependent on the external field that you can then measure, right? Um, so the, the, the, this is the core equation for most of the NMR experiments. There is, and it, an optical magnetometer is no different. And then there is it, it to do, um, so let me just tell that, um, let me just tell you that, you know, there is a, let, let's assume there is a, a, a glass uh, of uh, some, you know, atomic vapor, um, some uh, alkali um, metal vapor, um, let's say rubidium, and uh, you, you send some light, some laser light through it. Let's say this is uh, circularly polarized. The, uh, the idea is that um, the angular momentum of, of the uh, nuclear spin or, or of the uh, atomic magnetic moment uh, transfers to the light that passes through it. So there's light atomic interaction and uh, the um, angular momentum information that stays in the light can be detected later on. And you then infer the magnetic field that the spin is at. So that's the whole idea. And the uh, parameter, uh, the, the, um, to parameterize the strength of interaction, you look at the Rebbe frequency where you, where it, uh, you know, the uh, E0 is, the, is related to the light's electric field and D is the electric dipole moment um, related to the atom. Uh, so this, this here is, is just a, um, probing a beam there. You see there's, there's a magnetic field, I'm saying, an external magnetic field that polarized the spin, caused some alarmer frequency. And then we pick this up, this precession, this spin precession, we pick that angular momentum up with some laser light that goes through it. Um, however, this seems the same, a similar scheme could also be used for optical pumping, to pump the uh, atoms in a known state. Um, so the idea is as follows, you send some light, um, it could be circular light just for easiness, um, through some, uh, through some uh, atomic um, uh, vapor cell, um, then uh, let's say the atomic spin polarization was pointing at the direction of the uh, uh, light propagation, and uh, you have, let's say, two, just, you know, two level systems that are uh, separated 
FNF prime, as you call the you know, higher energy state, lower energy state, a spin minus spin plus, and uh, you uh, drive the spins from a light state where uh, the spins are sensitive to the circular polarization to a dark state that there is nowhere for these spins to, um, to uh, absorb and go, basically. So this, this state is called dark. And then you have some net polarization here in this state. So then you have optical, polariza optical pumping, optical polarization, um, and uh, which is much larger than the thermal polarization that I just mentioned with, the, uh, with just the leading magnetic field there. And um, so, right, so if there is some magnetic field, if there is a magnetic field that turns on, if non adiabatically, if, just, if it just turns on and uh, your spins start processing to it, then um, you can pick it up by, um, by uh, using another light source. So here I have pump and probe beam. So this is the pump beam that goes through there. And this is the probe beam that goes through uh, the uh, atomic cell in orthogonally. This is the block sphere, by the way, um, for those of you who don't know. And uh, so if you send the light uh, wave uh, that is um, uh, linearly polarized, the polarization of light will change based on the uh, precession angle or the precession of the, uh, of the, uh, of the spins. So this is the basic idea of optical magnetometers. They have been around since 60s. It has been uh, around 60 years that they have been around, but um, they are recently, maybe in the, next, in the last 20 years, have becoming um, uh, even more um, sensitive. Um, and right, so um, I forgot. So um, right, so let's say you, this is the polarized state, right? And then you turn on the magnetic field and then you start, um, driving the spins between these two F states. Um, let's say the, there is some external magnetic field that drives the spins through these, uh, through these states, and you can uh, measure this, this, these beats, this quantum beats between these two states, which give an idea, which, which then you, uh, lets you infer the external magnetic field over there. Right, so um, here I talked about just the uh, uh, non-modulated, just the you know, continuous wave light, but you could also have uh, modulated light that, uh, that you use to take measurements. So this is a slightly more complicated um, drawing of what's going on. It just, you know, there's a chamber over here. This is the cell that I mentioned. There are some shields, which I'll talk in a bit about. Um, some um, the high mu metal shields that shield it from external RF interference. And um, some electronics, the laser lights that go through it. And then there is the, uh, the output goes through a beam splitter. You take a measurement, look in an amplifier to change the um, sensitive electric signals into a sensitive, um, or you have a photodiode to convert the current to a voltage or the, um, the light into a current. And then you convert it to, you, you elucidate the uh, very low signal using a local amplifier at a known frequency. Um, so these are all for sensitive detection. Um, so the fancy part of the last 20 years of optical magnetometry lies in here, actually, that we have learned how to uh, properly uh, analyze uh, the signal for, uh, for a very uh, good um, signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and also in the fact that we, um, we have higher power lasers. Um, but in any case, so here, the, uh, the important part of the setup is the frequency modulation. There you see, uh, it just goes out. So there you see this using the, uh, um, using the, the, the coil control here, oh, sorry, using the oscillator here with the uh, computer, um, you um, can modulate the frequency of the light. The idea is, is very um, simple. While you are modulating the frequency of light, you can observe uh, the atomic transition, the, the, uh, what's happening around the atomic transition, if, and if there is an external magnetic field, the atomic transition will shift ever so slightly due to Zeeman effect, and you can then pick up the Zeeman effect. So uh, you, the, the, the point of this uh, peak will change whether there is an external magnetic field or not, and then you just have to track this, uh, this, um, this uh, tip point uh, to understand the external magnetic field. Um, so the frequency modulated and more uh, device is, is very um, is one of the most sensitive um, atomic magnetometers as there is right now. 
Um, there is also amplitude modulation, which, which also gives the same effect as frequency modulation, as you might think. Um, uh, the, you you modulate when you modulate the amplitude laser light. Um, due to the, uh, if you take the Fourier transform, it's all obvious. But so the idea is is, is similar. You have a laser light output. You modulate for uh, pumping purposes. You uh, more effectively pump the laser, uh, pump the uh, atomic states uh, to the uh, hyperpolar state, uh, to the um, uh, dark state. And uh, so a typical setup uh, looks like this, that uh, this is a real um, life setup at Berkeley that I worked on. And uh, this is human sized. I'm shorter than an average human, but this is taller than me. So I'm calling it human size. Um, there are, uh, this is a shield, a very large mu metal shield that looks like a, a, a can. And um, inside this is more shields like a Russian doll. There is, and then inside it is a cell of about five centimeters size. Uh, the pump beam setup is here, the probe beam setup is here. So you send light in through tiny holes on the shield uh, from both sides, and, uh, and you take the measurement. So um, there are several important considerations one should have for an optical uh, magnetometer, um, as I called it, an atomic vapor cell um, that. Uh, that uh, is about a centimeter a size, centimeter in size. This is a glass cell that has room temperature um, atomic vapor of, uh, of uh, alkali metals. Um, the, uh, the, the, the idea is to have the atoms go through, uh, go through the cell uh, with, while colliding with each other. Right, that's that's what's happening when you have an, a non-zero temperature for atoms. Um, but um, the the issue is that when atoms collide with each other, they lose coherence. Um, they they lose their um, uh, angular momentum information that causes the uh, total loss of coherence in the system. So uh, they either need to not bounce with each other so often. And with the wall of the uh, glass, by the way, they do not need, they should not bounce with each other all so often. And uh, um, then you should have a long coherence time. That's the biggest limitation in um, optical magnetometers that there is that um, compared to the classical systems, let's say, the uh, coherence time is very limited. Um, so, now, um, so if you have a bare glass surface inside the cell, the uh, the coherence time is so short that the, uh, the, the, the, um, the bouncing frequencies, you can see the bouncing frequency here, converted to the coherence time, it's very short uh, compared to if you have some inert buffer gas. The idea is of having inert buffer gas like helium inside is that it sort of causes a shield. It, it acts like a shield. Some bounces happen with the helium instead of the, uh, at, uh, instead of the alkali atoms. Uh, so they, they do not lose uh, the, um, um, the angular momentum to the, um, to the inert buffer gas. Um, but the problems with uh, having a helium, the, the, the good thing about having a helium there is that you uh, could actually then, uh, if you are able to put the um, helium back in and out, you could, uh, you could continuously hyperpolarize the system with the helium. If you hyperpolarize the helium outside, you could continuously hyperpolarize, transfer the polarization to the system. But this, this is a closed system, right? So um, what, they, what these um, inert buffer gas do is they uh, perturb actually the optical pumping. They take away some of the optical pumping energy, so to say. So you can't, you, you lose power in your optical pumping in the, um, in the uh, uh, alkali atoms and uh, the it also causes an homogeneous broadening which basically means if you expect a nice very nice Lorentzian line shape in your NMR um, and all of a sudden you have something that is broadened has some Gaussian in it that has side peaks and uh, that's that's a bit of a problem to um, to to uh, to analyze the data with um, the e, the best solution that we have yet came out with came up with is paraffin coating so you just very nicely, very thinly put paraffin inside the glass tube, and um, uh, just just you know it. it um, you can think of it as like a, a, a as like an oil inside. Uh, it just um, 
eases the, uh, uh, the atoms colliding with the wall. But then there is variation in observing in observations of uh, coherence times, so that there is no standard uh, way of coating with paraffin. So that's this is a simple problem, but this is a, a still a challenge within the community to how to very nicely coat your cells. And there are people who are known to be uh, famous with uh, very good coating that they have; that their cells have very long coherence times, but then. Not all, everybody has that, so there is a, a it, it gives us sort of a non-standard, non-equilibrium non thing that, it, it, that, is, um, uh, that is a problem uh, for the advancement of this field into becoming something very standard, um, I should say. Um, so, um, and there, this is very interesting, I, I just added this here, uh, my, my, my postdoc advisor had found this back in 2008, uh, seven that there is um, so this is a glass cell that was handmade and you see here there's a tiny needle over there they figured out that if they heat up the cell long enough you heat up the cell for um in, during the experiment for longer coherence times when you heat up the cell and then cool it down there happens to be some um some uh, uh, uh, uh how, how do you say some uh, uh needles forming on the cell, uh, around the cell, and uh, they infer with the uh, gas forming later on. So uh, the, the, that's, that's one of the bigger problems. And turns out that NASA was working on this because it, it also happens so for their electronics, but nobody had ever figured out that this happens for alkali metal. So just a little side note. And you can see that the, um, the uh, um, with, uh, Paraffin coating, this is just a figure that, says, that gives coherence times for 250 different, somebody sat down in, I think, 90s, sat down and paraffin coated 250 different cells, and then they, they took data, they measured each cell separately for transfers and longitudinal coherence times for their uh, uh, magnetizations uh, processing, and they found out a very large uh, variation, so that's just, uh, just, just to prove what I said. And uh, there's also shielding that is very important the, um, for, for an optical magnetometer because it's very prone to external magnetic fields. Um, a, a, so if you, want, if, you're, if, if you want to measure uh, uh, the magnetic field of, let's say, the Earth, then of course your system should be open. But if you're trying to measure a magnetic field that is um, very small and within an uh, enclosed area, then, um, or that, that is very small and should be in an enclosed area, um, there, uh, then you should use uh, for, uh, then you should use some shielding. Um, so different types of shieldings are ferromagnetic ferrite and superconducting shieldings. The mostly used one is ferromagnetic with high mu, high permeability. Um, it's ideal, ideally spherical, but you can't make it uh, spherical, uh, so you have to use some cylindrical sheet. Uh, ferrite shields are better, actually. They have low, lower edge current losses, but they're brittle uh, ceramic materials. So you can't really make them into sheets. And superconducting shields are cryogenic in temperature. They're limited in size. So it's, this is a room temperature setup. So it's not as advantageous to use a superconducting shield. So we mostly use ferromagnetic shields, but this is also one of the ongoing problems in the field. You can also have, uh, I noticed that I'm, I went a bit small, a bit slow, I guess, but I'll just wrap up in, let's say, five minutes. Um, Sorry about that. So the um, microfabricated optical magnetometer exists, which is great, uh, but it doesn't have uh, the uh, utmost sensitivity that an optical magnetometer has. The one that I showed that was human sized, it, it, the, the microfabricated optical magnetometer is, is not there yet, is not in sensitivity there yet, but it has compared competitive sens comparative sensitivities with squids. So squids are superconducting quantum interference devices in uh, the field of magnetic sensing, I'll just show a picture of a squid later on. It's not the animal squid, but it's a device that um, does operate at low temperatures, at uh, 4 Kelvin, let's say, at liquid helium temperatures. Um, they have very low uh, noise figures. They are known to have very low, low noise figures, but they have to be cryogenically cooled down. But this system doesn't need to be cooled down. It's at room temperature. And uh, this can be used at uh, biophysical and geophysical detections. Again, it's not at the best sensitivity. So you have a very small cell, three millimeters uh, size cell um, that, can, uh, that can measure the, uh, the uh, external magnetic field. 
so very quickly about NMR. So um, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is related to some, some let's say, um, some spins that are in some external field, and then you uh, send some oscillating external magnetic field to drive the spins between two energy levels. So you start with two energy levels, you have some spins, polarize the spins, and then drive the spins. And uh, there is a resonance condition with the NMR, as, as you call it resonance, that the drive, the oscillating magnetic fields, oscillation frequency should equal to the splitting between spins up and down, or if you have a larger level system, the splitting's there. So a typical signal that you see is a Lorentzian. As you see, this is one of my measurements during my PhD. And uh, right, so the output measurement depends on the external magnetic field. The reason for NMR machines that you see in chemistry labs to have such large magnetic fields is this, that the output voltage that you measure is directly related to the large static magnetic field that you apply to. Um, so that's why people put millions and millions into their divorce, into cooling their divorce down to um, millikelvins because they use superconducting loops, which I'm just going to show quickly. So this is from my PhD. Um, they use a superconducting um, uh, uh, so, uh, solenoids, the one that you see here, um, to, uh, which are basically, um, which is basically a solenoid that is made of superconducting wire that uh, when cooled down to very low temperatures can run current without a loss of energy. And uh, so you can go and in, in typical, uh, you know, lab scale um, solenoids, you can go up to nine, 15 Teslas in magnetic fields, which are huge. And that increases the signal that you measure. So the squids are the devices that I just showed. They're finger sized and uh, they are just uh, loops of superconducting, superconductor uh, wires that um, uh, sort of give a, a, a quantized response to changing magnetic fields. And this is an MRI, which is the largest cryogenic setup for high field NMR, which uh, costs millions of dollars is ten, seven tons in weight, uses a lot of liters of helium and uh, needs a large magnetic field. So this is a hefty thing. You, you, there aren't many, uh, uh, there aren't many uh, uh, MRI machines in a city for this reason. They're expensive and they're expensive to run because they use so much helium. Um, there comes now, comes, uh, as I say, a little hero uh, to, perhaps maybe save the day one day, that um, we could use optical magnetometers to do zero to ultra low field NMR. So now what I meant in high field was this Teslas, this large magnetic fields that are applied. Now zero to ultra low field means small magnetic fields, so no superconducting coils, no superconducting um, solenoids, so no cryogenics required. NMR done at very small um, external static magnetic fields, the, um, the uh, idea is that the signal, if you do things classically, the signal will not be as large, but if you do optical magnetometry, then you will still get a very good signal to noise ratio, even though the signal is not large, you have a very low noise figure. So um, basically there is no Zeeman effect, no large static magnetic field applied. So you, I just showed you a vapor cell, pump beam, probe beam, you remember? Now, if you put some uh, NMR tube that has some liquid of any substance that you want to measure very near to the vapor cell, then you can take the, then it, it, it, if the spin starts processing, if you apply some magnetic fields to the spin starts processing, then this precession will be picked up by the vapor cell. Then it will be picked up by the probe light that goes through it. So then you will have some measurement. And this is the Zulf magnetometer that's currently at UC Berkeley, but I have been uh, donated this by my advisor. So I'll carry it wherever I go. Uh, at this point, so this is very good. Um, so uh, the, the typical, so we, the, there has been those measurements done with very uh, simple systems with some uh, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen systems, typically measuring hydrogen here, that you see uh, zero field spectra. Now in NMR people in chemistry, they really need to see these slight splittings to understand the slight connections, the different um, bondings between molecules. But uh, if you're at near zero, you can still see these uh, differences. That's the idea. So there you see a single Lorentzian. These two Lorentzians are engulfed into one. And then if you apply a slightly larger than zero field, then you see a slight splitting. And uh, getting there to the end, sorry about taking long. Um, 
Now, this is the ideal sulf magnetometry, a, sulf of a, a magnetometer, right? You have a tube near a vapor cell. Now, um, uh, what we have done during my PhD was actually not uh, an OMR only, but to use it for a niche purpose to do some particle search for dark matter. So there's this theory that says there is dark matter in the universe, and it could be due to uh, axion, a particle called axion. We do not know the particle nature of it. Some people at CERN look for WIMPs. We were looking for axions. Um, so uh, the, the idea was that if there is an axion field, it can go through the shield, right? And then you, you can shield the setup all you want. It can go through the shield, and then you measure the axion field in the Zulf, uh, not with NMR, but just through the Zulf setup that there is a, uh, there is a, a, a, a, a, let's say, a sample there. And uh, you, we also used, during my postdoc, use these cool. optical magnetometers to, this one slide, to, to, do, uh, to do, again, a search for exotic physics using a global network of optical magnetometers, some through the Earth, uh, say in China, in, uh, in Israel, in US, and uh, in Poland, that we took time synchronized measurements to look for peculiar changes in these local magnetic fields. And um, so the future that I am very excited about is using Zulf NMR, maybe in MRI. There are people who do low field NMR, MRI. So this, uh, this group in, in Boston, in uh, Harvard, had done some Hallbach cylinder. So this is a large static magnetic field generator, uh, the, the supermagnet magnet, that, uh, so different from a superconducting coil, different from a cryogenic MRI machine, this does not require low temperatures, yes, but this is also very heavy and it has inductive sensing, which is limiting in sensitivity and it's not modular and you can only do brain or certain parts of MRI. Uh, with it, um, so Zulf NMR, Zulf NMR uh, can has been you know measured for um, imaging purposes. This is water molecule passing through an MRI sump and NMR, an NMR setup. We have not yet realized it for any human uh, subjects as much, um, but um, you can see that the uh, you know the uh, the sensitivity it, we we see the sensitivity dropping at distance. So this the, the main problem is that skull. <laughs> there is a brain and there is a skull and there is a sensor. So the more distant you get from the the, the sample, the lower the sensitivity. And uh, there's limited sensitivity at at this point in microfabricated uh, optical magnetometers. Thank you for listening. Sorry for taking long time. And Thank you. This is my favorite cartoon. I should just explain that it's just how in uh, magnetometry we just talk with our hands too often. Thank you very much. Efendim hocam, ben pazartesi döneceğim. Evet hocam. Aha, hocam yani ihtiyaç yoksa olmasam daha iyi. Aha, tamam. Working with, right? So it, it it purely depends on that. It could be left circular for different systems. Depends where okay. the dark state. Okay, so, so it's, so a, you're to get it's an important parameter. It I, is, yes. For the goal research. But there is okay. no global saying that it should be uh, right-handed or left. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we shall continue. We thank the speaker again. But first, uh, maybe I can give her her certificate. Ah. <laughs> thank you again thank once you. more. Okay, our third speaker is uh, Shenar Oktik. He's going to talk about nanotechnology for photovoltaics. Thank you. Is a good morning or good afternoon? We are in the beautiful city, Bodrum but the nights are too many here. I can see many people are not really still wake up. <laughs> Please try to wake up. What I'm gonna tell about is quite important for the future of energy. I can see the most of the people are still sleeping as a result of last night. 
I'll be talking about the nanotechnology for photovoltaics. We have been <coughs> hearing lots of different concepts related to nanotechnology. And probably some of you know photovoltaics deep enough, but I'll do a little exercise. This is my disclaimer. Please do not take everything is absolutely correct in the slides. These are the things I can collect uh, so far. I'll have the photovoltaic update. When we look at the selected milestones in photovoltaic, it started a long time ago in 1833 uh, by Faraday, etc. As you can see, there are lots of points, and these are all really progress of photovoltaic in time. And when you look at actual some uh, industrial implication of photovoltaic, we have to go back in 1954 in the Bell Lab, there was a first solar cells, which has a 4% efficiency, and the cost was around about $1,000 per watt. Of course, it progressed, and there was some commercial manufacturing by Hoffman Electronics, pushing the efficiency up to 14% in 1960s. There was a famous company called Arco Solar came around, and in 1960s, actually per watt reduced down to $100. And it goes uh, very fast during the oil crisis in 1970s. And when you look at the cost down to 20 watt, uh, $200 per watt, and the, the first the commercial PV model by Solar Power Corporation, Exxon, really take a bit uh, uh, speed in uh, progress. Then uh, starting 1980s, there was unprecedented scientific and technological progress in photovoltaic field, and the production capacity increased, cost reduction reduced, and where are we now? Is there any more really room for improving photovoltaic conversion efficiency using nanotechnology? In fact, when you look at this story is quite a long story. It's almost 180 years story in photovoltaic progress. I saw, I put one of the, my picture there. I was working in 1980s in photovoltaic, trying to really improve the efficiency of thin film photovoltaics. Of course, the efficiency is going up quite fast. As you can see, uh, for the single junction photovoltaic cells, monocrystalline reached to 26.7 in the lab, and the multicrystalline 24.4. Thin films are fighting with each other. There are CG, uh, CIGS 23%, cadmium telluride 21%, and perovskite is coming to scene with the efficiency around about 24%. Of course, their tandem, as you can see up there, there are perovskite on silicon, which is about almost 30%, and you can have now 47% cells with two, uh, three fives. Okay, but when you look at the real life, the actual production of a photovoltaic over the year has been changing. The substrate going from multicrystalline silicon to monocrystalline silicon. And tin film at one stage had some meaning in photovoltaic field, it disappeared more or less very small amount of uh, tin film uh, share in the market of photovoltaic. Last year, there was 190 gigawatt production all over the world, but the world is moving so fast, so appetizing this area. Actual production capacity is 500 gigawatts. Same happens in Turkey. When you look at how much photovoltaic modules produced in Turkey, is around about five to six gigawatt, and how much capacity Turkey has almost 21 gigawatt module production capacity. So the capacity is there, but most of the capacity is relying on the past technology, which are not really active anymore. Of course, when you go from cell to modules, it changes a little bit, you lose efficiencies. This related on again another area for nanotechnology or reflection, glass surface, uh, 
packaging, etc., etc. These are the sort of figures for the existing best lab uh, modules. But when you go to market, if you want to buy it, this is a list probably it's not easy to read, but as you can see, the best efficiency is around about uh, 24 again on the market, about average is 21% what you can buy from the market. And who is producing and who is using it? As you can see, Asia is really producing most of it, 94%, 75% of them in China. Europe is not producing photovoltaic anymore, only 1%. US and Canada is 3%. When you look at the installation, Germany is only 7% among the Europe. Europe is 22% in total. But China is, again, taking the lead in here. OK, this is the final uh, slide for summary for photovoltaic. Photovoltaic is really intermittent power source. So we need the storage. Storage is another area which, again, interesting in nanotechnology. OK, but when we look at it, really, how much is there installed all over the world in Turkey? It's a quite a short time ago, really, we reached today's figure. Only last five years, we've got 70% of total installation in the world. And in Turkey, 99% of the photovoltaic devices really put in the last five years. Before that, we've got some devices on the field, which is quite an amount. This is another subject really needs to be discussed. How are we going to recycle the photovoltaic modules? Those are not efficient enough for us today. OK, the problem is, of course, the limitation. If we are really limiting ourselves in a single junction, we have to talk about Shockley quasi limit, which is 33%. As you can see on that table there, it has been pushed for a different combination towards the top of the quasi, uh, Shockley quasi limit. But no one, no <coughs> cell reached to there yet. So the question is, how are we going to pass this limit using single junction cells? The answer is nanotechnology. So let's have a look at the nanotechnology. <coughs> For this, of course, we need the science and technology knowledge development. Of course, technology, technological development is important. And end of the day, end of the day, you have to sell it to someone. So it's a circular for innovation, for progress. You have to really have it. It applies to application of nanotechnology to photovoltaic field too. So where we are with this? Okay. Thank you. We have to really apply those concepts we have been discussing in nanotechnology for organic and inorganic materials to improve, to really use the quantum mechanics uh, effects. Okay, when you say nanotechnology, always you have to start with Feynman. This was, he was the first guy saying that plenty of room at the bottom. You have to go down a little bit further. And in 1974, that was the first time Norio Taniguchi used the term of nanotechnology. After that, in 1980s, this was the golden years, golden era for nanotechnology because of invention of scanning, tunneling microscopes. So you can play with atoms, you can play with electrons. Then discovery of, discovery of fluorines and fluorine derivatives. This was Nobel Prize in 1996. Then come the synthesis of controlled doping of polymers, which is quite important milestone in nanotechnology. And it was Nobel Prize in 2000. Then discovery of new class carbon nanomaterials, shorter than 10 nanometer, like carbon dots. And discovery of graphene is another milestone for nanotechnology. Of course, Electroinductive polymers is to be mentioned. We all know we can really think of one, two, three, zero, one, two, three dimension nanomaterials. 
and this has all different uh, applications in the photovoltaic. But when you say in one day dimension, if the dimension is less than 100 nanometer, you can call that one at that dimension nanomaterial. Okay, what we can get with uh, nanotechnology for photovoltaic, we can design a nanoscale surface structure. Joshkin is not here. He was talking about how you can really play with graphene for the surface uh, structures. And you can have a tunable absorption and you can have reduced reflection. And you've got transparent low resistivity contacts for charge collection, nano coatings for improved efficiency, designing innovative solar cell structure employing nanotechnology, organic semi-transparent and tunable transparent solar cell that's called transparent optical uh, transparent organic solar cells nano wires to improve efficiency and photocatalyst in solar cells so you can really add up the, to the list okay what we gain with the nanotechnology we have got large surface to volume ratio which is very beneficial and we scientifically improve that we can really improve the photo uh, carrier collection, uh, absorption in nanowires, nanopillars, and nanocones. And important thing, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more, quantum confinement is an important issue to be really followed in, nano, uh, in photovoltaics. And we go the nanoscale, we, we, I'm not going to go in detail, but we change the electronic levels, interaction between electronic level with photons, vibration modes, phonons, etc. So it gives us this quantum confinement effect uh, in photovoltaic. This could be geometric quantum, geometric co confinement effect in photovoltaic conversion and optical management based nanostructures in photovoltaic. Well, depending on really uh, your dimension you're dealing with in nanotechnology, you can talk about quantum well, quantum wire, quantum dots, nanocrystals. Most of the time, those nanocrystals is embedded in uh, the material, and then electron wave function do not overlap with each other because of these uh, nanomaterials. When we talk about semiconductor nanocrystals, actually they are embedded in insulating host material, which, call, which will be called matrix, allowing the electron transferred from one nanostructure to other. So the actual conduction has been changing in these materials compared to conventional understanding. For instance, when you really reduce the size of the nanocrystal, what you see, you start really changing the <coughs> density of electron states. This is the first one is a three dimensional nano structure. As you can see, there are much change in the function of electron, dens uh, electron state density as a function of energy. And you can see the band gap. But when you go to the two dimension, you can see how your Density of electron state as a function of energy is changing, and your band gap is changing. And you go one di direction, and you have the singularity in zero dimension, uh, and you have really different uh, electron band gap. So we, this could be really benefit we, and when we get the practically employed in the structures. In fact, <laughs> the calculation shows if you've got <laughs> spherical nanocrystals of known material. For instance, this shows from 100 nanometer to what's around about two, three nanometer, particle radius of those nanospheres, you can see how the band gap is changing theoretically. Two material we know, the germanium and silicon, we always know, okay, silicon, what's the band gap of silicon? Okay, one, 1.1. 1. 1. But actually, you can change the silicon band gap with nanocrystal up to 3 eV. So you've got the same material, you can play with the band gap as you wish. So with the same material, you're, al you're allowed to have a variety of the band gap in this material, in the, in the device. So this is a big benefit. 
In fact, this is one picture I took this from this PhD in 2012. It's a long way, long way. This is the cadmium tetrahedral quantum dots. When they are excited with UV, you can see decreasing the nanocrystal size. Actually, color is changing significantly. As you can see from this uh, graph on the left, as a uh, wavelength as a function of uh, uh, absorption, actual nanocrystal size is directly related to band gap. The other thing, actually, with the quantum confinement, the actually band diagrams will also change. The example is in here. Actually, you can see the electron affinity can be changed with titanium oxide. You can see different uh, nanoparticle size for cadmium selenide. You can see how actually a relationship between titanium oxide and the cadmium selenide is changing. So you, you change electron affinity. This is one example of solar cell based on silicon nanoparticles. I'm not going to read all the slides, but the actual picture says to us, if you have quantum dot junction, starting, if you start with an ordinary silicon with 1.1 EV, you have a quantum dot junction on top of it with the 1.5 EV, you can have another one, two EV, you start really utilizing larger spectrum of solar energy to convert. So you have one material, but tandem. So you have really chance of really going over the shock they cause a limit. If you go to organic, simple says, okay, we can compare organic, inorganic. When you say valence band, you can talk about the highest occupied molecular orbital as an analogous HOMO and conduction band lowest unoccupied molecular orbital LUMO and the band gap is the difference between two. So we know quite a lot on the inorganics, but in organic you can really play around the same concept and correlate analogous and you really talk about <laughs> excitons rather than now is electrons for conduction, and this opens a new area for us. The photovoltaic devices, but there was some problem. They were, they were too thin to absorb all the light. Uh, there was, again, when you increase the thickness, the exciton, exciton efficiency, exciton dissociation is, was limited, and this was a problem. What has been done going to nanoscale, you know, having nanoscale random domains between 10 and 20 nanometer and overcome this one with bulk heterojunction cells in organic photovoltaic devices. And so far, 18% efficiencies achieved this uh, bulk heterojunction organic photovoltaic devices. This is really schematically explaining what, what's happening there. You know, just uh, absorbing the light in the molecular orbitals, creating extons, and you can see you've got donor type polymer, acceptor uh, donor uh, type molecule, an acceptor type molecule, you can have HUMA and LUMO, you really like heterojunction, but all those are really a different uh, cluster at the size of 10 to 20 nanometers. In 2015, the efficiency was 11%. In 2020, more than 18% efficiency was declared. This is a quite promising area. And novel design of these molecules is a quite an interesting subject has been worked, worked by many, many groups. For instance, in 2020, single junction non-fluorine organic solar cells was 18.22. I'm not going to go in detail of the <laughs> molecules in here, but this is the results in 2020. 
There was a problem with fluorines. Now that the non-fluorine uh, materials are more uh, optimistic, again, I sort of try to express pro and cons of fluorines and non-fluorines. And probably I should say a couple of words on plus <laughs> plasmonic photovoltaic. As you know, a plasmon is a quantum plasma oscillation, and they are really a reason from the free electron gas in conduction, uh, co conducting material. But we've got different types of plasmons, bulk plasmons, surface plasmons, and localized surface plasmons. How we can utilize those concepts in photovoltaic? For instance, if you have really surface of a silicon really uh, coated with nanoparticles, nanometal uh, nano metallic particles, you start really creating surface plasmons. Then uh, you can increase, I'm not going to go in detail because time is allowing me, I wish we have another session to discuss in detail, but you can really improve the effect of uh, absorption on the surface because you really help the field using the uh, <coughs> plasmonic effect on the surface through the metal nanoparticles. In, in fact, there was a five times increase in the average absorption of gold coated nanoparticles, uh, gold nanoparticles coated silicon nanopyramids and flat-topped nanocones compared to the bare silicon. Five times increase in absorption due to nanomaterials. How much? Five minutes, okay, I'll go fast. <laughs> and okay, the, most of you know, in the nano size, we can create the black silicon, create the surface uh, on the silicon, improve, uh, uh, decrease the reflection. And, <laughs> Probably I should say a couple of words on challenge on the down converter, down shifter, and up converters. As we know, is uh, when the selected semiconductor has a certain bank up value to absorb, if the coming light is larger than the bank up, it's thermally wasted. But if you use really a down converter, you can really generate two incident photons from that. And down shifter, shifting high energy photons into more efficient region for the solar cell absorber. You can do that. And up conversion is, is the production of a component absorbing at least two photons, having a energy shorter than the bank up, but putting them together really creating electronal pairs. Of course, just uh, I'll, I'll mention the heading because of time is uh, li not limiting. The multiple exton generation solar cells, another area really using nanotechnology and uh, quantum concepts. The other one is hot carriers of solar cells. The third one, transparent organic photovoltaic technologies in here, We've got luminescence solar concentrator systems, novel design for wavelength selective organic PV. For instance, luminescence solar cell LSC system, you can have a lumipores on the surface you can create, and can, you can direct solar energy or photons to the side of the uh, window or wherever. You can really have transparent window using uh, LSC. <laughs> this is the work in pores on a dual band TLSC. Uh, probably I should talk about one of the technology developed in, uh, I think Stanford. Yeah, Stanford University, I think. Actually, this is on the market now. It is a really useful. Choose 
take this idea, make a device and the patent. Again, it's all playing with the molecules as in the, as in the picture I showed earlier. And there was a Yes. Yes, I am here, Mahmoud Aydinov. Yes, I opened. Okay, our next talk is online, uh, so we need help uh, for the connection. Okay, next talk is uh, Pnar Manguj. Is she connected? Pnar Manguj. She's going to talk I'm... about sustainable energy transition. Oh, Jam. Yes, uh, I think if you can give me a uh, permission to share. I cannot hear you. Uh, can you give me permission to share? Okay, R r right now we are able to hear you. Okay. Great. So, okay. Uh, welcome. So everybody is ready to listen to you. Okay. Uh, you have 25 minutes for the talk and five minutes for the questions. But can you give me the permission to share my screen? Okay. Ekran paylaşımı yapmak istiyor hocamız. İzin verir misiniz? Of course. Okay, I think I can do it now. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's it's wonderful to be here, to be able to talk at this important 
Physics Congress, the 39th of them, especially for the 100th year of the, the Republic. So I thank Oz Gülseren, Professor Oz Gülseren and the entire committee for inviting me. Um, I have been uh, working on physics in many details uh, from nanotechnology to radiation transfer in different levels. But in the recent uh, years, I have been working on energy efficiency, which is really a complex problem, that which uh, justifies it to be presented at the physics conference as well. Now, when we talk about just the energy efficiency, it may not sound like it is uh, an important topic at once, but once you start getting in there, you begin to see a very complicated uh, issue, and that's the reason I want to present to you what we have been doing over the years at the Energy, uh, Environment and Economy Center at Özgen University. So it's energy, I think there's no need for you to explain what it is about. But when you begin to think about energy and behavior, you begin to question what is going on. The bottom line is really coming to that one. And after that should come the design design of the processes, gadgets, tools, and then maybe the laws. And uh, that makes the life a little bit more complicated. We have to get into the fundamental research, which is based on physics and the design most of the time. But the integrated research from nanotechnology to architecture should be part of this. Beyond that, when you start putting the humans in there, it becomes transdisciplinary research, which is really not easy to explain. And that allows us to get into behavioral energy. But why is it so? Um, well, the simple problem, climate change, we all know. In it, you can make a first law analysis there if you want. Just put a, a control volume around the earth and think about how much energy is coming and reflect it off or emit it. And then you can find the reasons for that, including the greenhouse gases or particles and so on. And then you begin to question what is going on in earth that causes these problems. Once you get in there, you find the fundamental physics there, reflections, clouds, uh, long wave radiation. But the bottom line is reflection and absorption and some emission, of course. Yet, when you look at the bigger picture, you find out that all of the history of Earth, we always had uh, fires and other natural phenomena, volcanoes and all kinds of storms. Yet in the last several hundred thousand years, we begin to see the impact. Uh, Sayın hocam, çok özür diliyorum. Müdahale edeceğim. Bağlantının <gülüyor> kalitesi için vi kendi videonuzu kapatabilir misiniz? Bazen kesinti oluyor. Okay. Kendi videonuzu konuşurken. <gülüyor> Teşekkür ederim. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Arkadaşlar siz müdahale edebiliyorsanız siz kapın hocanın görüntüsü. Attım ben. Uh, is it okay now? I think it works now, right? Okay. Um, let me go back and please let me know if you can see my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Now, if you look at the uh, natural phenomena, that's what you see on the uh, orange bar on the left, but the, the human at activities, anthropogenic activities are on the right. So when you begin to see, we start changing the earth situation. It's because of our desire to use more energy. It's our desire to change our living conditions along which we discovered the fire and everything. And you begin to see the end effect. You begin to see our impact to the surroundings and other things. And it goes back to almost 250 years ago. 
to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Indeed, we can trace it back to James Watt. And coal combustion was an important thing. And that goes back to where we started working on some of the problems related to huge coal combustion systems. The reason I put this slide is still we are dealing with coal. I'll show you in a minute. But then in addition to coal, we use all the natural gas and everything else. And because we begin to have the cities, we have the dwellings, we have more comfortable life, the, the, all of these start affecting us. What can we do about this problem? Especially if you look at some of the statistics, which I will not show many of them, but these are the upper two figures are from the world, how much carbon dioxide emission we are having on earth and then what is going on in turkey there's continuous increase and coal is important part of this when you look at the future again i will not get into details you can find some of these charts everywhere in the in the internet you find out that whatever you do this keeps increasing so we have to come out with extraordinarily innovative new ideas and one of the figures that I liked a lot is coming from the International Energy Agency a few years ago. They looked at all possible solutions to avoid the current trends. And two important ones, buildings and behavioral change, are our focus. The impact of behavioral change until 2050 is comparable to the impact of the renewable energy, solar or wind energy. So that is interesting. And with that idea, we started looking at also how the world is going to change by 2050 or so. One interesting um, statistics that came just recently, renewables will pass coal energy production in 2024 around the world. But that's not enough because coal is still very high. So you still have to do something about all kinds of use. So with this idea in mind, uh, we started looking energy systems, transport phenomena, radiative transfer. These are the two books that I have been using. Just one minute, there's a phone. Hello? Uh, Thermal radiation heat transfer is my area. Light plasmonics and particles is another area. And of course, you can go to the physics and begin to see what's going on there. Uh, but, hello. Uh, uh, also, John.
Hocam duyabiliyor musunuz bizi? E, evet. Now can you hear me? Tamam duyabiliyoruz Hayır. hocam. E, bir iki okay. slide geriden başlarsanız rica etsem. Tamam. Teşekkür ederim. Okay. Um, well, sorry for everybody for some problems on the internet. But anyway, what I was talking about the coal combustion, which goes back to James Watt era. I will not talk about that time, but you can imagine that at the end of that work, which is really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that affected a lot of things. And I worked on some of these problems back then when I was doing my PhD and so on. These are huge systems. And eventually you begin to see that coal starts fueling the world and buildings and uh, transportation and everybody and then the gas and everything else. And we begin to see additional effects on the atmosphere. So all these problems now are not just physics, but they are beyond it. And we see continuous increase of the impact on society and on atmosphere since then. There are many strategies how to avoid it. Not easy. I like this graphic, and that's what I was mentioning before. This is the suggestion by the International Energy Agency, what to do about everything. We cannot just solve the problem with one uh, simple idea. Solar energy will add only a few percent. Wind energy will add a few percent. Improving the uh, motors will add a few percent. When you look at this, buildings and behavioral energy turns out to be a very important two areas, and especially behavioral energy is not well studied. So that's the reason we start getting into that, and also understanding that coal, like fossil fuels, will continue to be with us for a long time. In 2024, maybe renewables will uh, surpass the coal energy production, but coal is still there because we need more energy. I have been working on the radiation transfer. These are the two books that we published in the last few years uh, on thermal radiation and the light plasmonics and particles. But the bottom line is to look at also not individual issues, but complex problem, the overall problem. Of course, Planck's approach if guide us on thermal radiation, but beyond that, the particles that are emitted or used from nanotechnology to everything affect our environment. Like the one that I circled here with red is the soot particles, and you see them everywhere, like maybe at the emission of a, a vapor or bus or anywhere. This is fuel that you not you do not burn and then you pollute the environment and also it causes all kinds of disease in people the cancer the liver cancer and so on the bottom line is the physics you look at what um, the, how you see these particles and then you question whether you can sense them by doing something and this is what we have been working on using elliptic depolarized light sketching to come out with a diagnostic tool to measure these particle size structure and agglomeration format. Uh, these are what we have developed over the years. These are the patents and the product that we eventually gave it to Horiba. So this is the physics part that I am really proud of what I have done in the past. But today's problem is a little bit beyond that because we would like to look at the big picture at the center and then see the societal impact which brings us to disciplinary, multidisciplinary problems, and then to interdisciplinary and to transdisciplinary problems where we begin to see the uh, human behaviors, uh, not rational, but irrational human behavior, and how we can include it in the buildings and other industrial problems where we can really use less energy for the same work. When you begin to look at them, the energy research includes energy generation, conservation, harvesting, and energy efficiency. Basically, my research has been on harvesting and efficiency, but today we are going to talk mostly on the efficiency. When you begin to talk energy efficiency, it's not energy conservation. It's not turn on and turn off. More than that, it's a path-dependent problem. It's design problem. So we have to look at the quality of the energy and how we can minimize energy density. 
it's used a lot. It's confused a lot with the energy conservation or energy savings, energy tasarrufu, energy verimli, or energy efficiency is quite different. We need to consider it as a transdisciplinary problem, along with the time, resource, human, and organizational efficiency. Just an example, a big problem. How can I tell a building how much energy it should use depending on my mood, where I am in a building, and what I am doing in a building? This can be a space where I can share with you, I may share with other people, like in office, or it may be in a house that I may be alone. Somehow, from my coatings to mud, my mood, to my IoT devices like my cell phone, to the, the air conditioning system or heating system, I need to have a uh, seamless operation. That requires some fundamental physics. Here, ME is Maxwell's equations, QM is quantum mechanics. Basically, it goes all the way to the nanotechnology where we can have the sensors, radiative transfer equation, Navier-Stokes equation, computational fluid dynamics, computational heat transfer. But now, for the sake of the society, let's put them in a box. Then let's concentrate on the function, comfort, energy efficiency, aesthetics, and ethics. This is most of the people out there want to hear. Comfort and energy efficiency will be the primary goal for the moment. For that, we have to look at the human building interactions and understand why they are wanting what they want. And then we have to somehow relate it to the building systems. Of course, this should not be one point measurement, multi-point measurement. And then we have to go to the aesthetics and then relate to function. We have worked on this problem for a number of years with one of my um, co-workers, he is now working as one of the senior researchers at the center, Jim Keskin. We looked at the occupant behavior and found the relation between innovation studies, behavioral sciences, and the, uh, the information sciences. This was a transdisciplinary approach combining all kinds of functions. And then you begin to sense and see what you can relate. The cyber technologies, healthy lifestyles, behavioral studies, all of them affect the building physics. Um, also, Jam? Tamam, o zaman bağlanıyorum. Ben tamam. Okay. Sorry for some connection, but I think it's not from my end. So sorry. Well, I'll go a little bit faster. I try to show you the big picture. And from this picture, we begin to come out with the complex systems where integrated engineering and architecture are done together. That helped us a lot. We came out with the most energy efficient in Turkey, where the energy density we use is the lowest among all academic buildings. We have measured it in a number of different ways. And the bottom line is we save more than $200,000 a year from the operation of the building compared to a much better building than the average, which is our flagship building. We continued working on that. We tried to change the building structure. This required Navier-Stokes equations, solution of the energy equation in more complex format and computational studies, and then coming out with the sensors. And we found out that on the average, we can change the temperature by two degrees. This is like 10% of energy change. 10% in building energy use correspond to almost half of the solar energy use in the country. So this is a huge thing if we can implement it. We have a number of papers on that. System is complex. You get into that. You have to look at a lot of averaging and so on. 
And then beyond it, we also looked at some other problems related to, especially for radiative cooling materials, where the sun is shining on a building, it still tries to cool. For that, we have to look at the spectroscopy, of course, get into the fundamental physics there and come out with different structures of materials or different sustainable materials available in the in, out there and use them for different purposes. Um, this allowed us to come to the next level of work at the center. We called it Center 2, CE2, where we begin to look at this energy efficiency from strategy and planning, building impact design, and occupant experience design point of view. This allowed us to come out to the value management based on science, which goes beyond energy and energy efficiency. It goes to materials, it goes to sustainability, it goes to fight with the nature, with the climate change at the same time. The second team that just started a few years ago is different than our first CE team. We had several grants in the past. Now we have several grants. And for that, we have a very comprehensive objective for overall work. And you can imagine that this is not a, a simple, straightforward problem. It's really complex problem that needs transition in academia as well as in the government. But this gives us the value management, which allows us to have the building impact, digital services, and occupant experience design approaches. A, a new pro, uh, project, a European Union project, will start this week, LegoPit. There we will test our uh, knowledge on a university campus uh, uh, dormitory. And there are several layers. I'm not going to go over this, but just present you how energy efficiency impacts strategy and planning, building impact assessment, occupant experience design, digital services design, and how the behavior really allow us to have significantly reduced energy density, energy efficiency use. This is not the only one. We also impact, uh, try to get into the industrial energy efficiency. This is completely new problem. Again, next in two weeks, we will have the start uh, of the new project with TUSIAD, where we will look at the industry and try to come out industrial energy efficiency, not industrial energy savings. That's done by the industry in many ways. This will be industrial energy efficiency. And we will have this in Istanbul. Fatih Birol will join us also to give us a, uh, the, the, his views. And then we will discuss many of these concepts. All these allowed us to come out with a very energy efficient, sustainable campus at Özyen University, which we are proud of. And some of our work is available in a book that we published a few years ago from Nano to Giga. And this QR code, if you take with your phone, it will allow you to get hold of that book. And the center has new concepts. And I think my time is up, so I will stop here. Uh, if there are other questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you.
Okay. So any questions last time maybe I can ask? Okay, uh, we thank him a lot. Please clap, yeah. Okay. We are very thank sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Okay, this was the last talk. Uh, sorry about this problem. Uh, technical problems, we cannot sometimes solve, uh, solve any solution. So uh, I'm going to close the session. Thank you very much for all the speakers and participants. Uh, I think there's a coffee break right now, right? Yo, lunch, lunch break. Okay, bye. Good. Oh, no.